Come on, clap, clap, clap your hands, everybody. Blessed be the name of our God. God is awesome. God is magnificent. His name is excellent. God has done wondrous and wonderful things. He is our God and he is our Father. We bless his holy and righteous name. It's so good to be in your presence, people of God. We say to you, good morning. And to all of those who are in our virtual community, we also say to you, good morning. We thank God for this magnificent music ministry. Come on and bless the Lord for them all. We thank and we honor God for the set man of this house, my brother, the, one of the best preachers, men of God, pastors that this world has ever seen. Come on and bless the Lord for Bishop Kevin L. Long. I'm so honored to be here in his stead and so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity. And uh, he is a great man of God, and we thank God for him. Look, I came to work. Somebody ought to start work, Bishop. You have your Bibles turned to Zechariah chapter number 9. Zechariah, that's in the Old Testament. Zechariah, that's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. There are 12 minor prophets. Zechariah is one of them. He is minor not because he is less significant, but minor simply because he wrote less. Anybody who is known as a minor prophet, I'll say it again, is not less significant. They just wrote less than a major prophet who would be considered Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. Zechariah chapter number 9, if you go down to verse 11, I'm going to read in your hearing from the message version, and this is what it says. And you, because of my blood covenant with you, I'll release your prisoners from their hopeless cells. Come home, hope-filled prisoners. This very day, I'm declaring a double bonus. Everything you lost returned twice over. Judah is now my weapon, the bow I'll pull, setting Ephraim as an arrow to the string. I'll wake up your sons, O Zion, to counter your sons, O Greece. From now on, people are my swords. That's enough. Every head is bowed. Kind Father, in Jesus' name, we come. I am your son. You are my father. These are your children. Now we need a life-changing word. The word that will not only bless us, but the word that will empower us and help us. In some cases, that it will even challenge us. We love you ahead of time for what you're going to do. Now do what only you can do, and that is to save, heal, and deliver. We trust you for all of these things. In the mighty name of Jesus and all the people of God said, amen. God bless you. Come on, clap, clap, clap your hands, everybody. Bless you as you're seated in the presence of the Lord. Somebody ought to shout, yes, Lord. I don't know about you, but this text is bothering me. It's messing with me something terrible. And of course, because it's bothering me, I am going to bother you. The text says to us by the conclusion of this text that I've read for you is that we are the swords of God. That in essence, God will use us as weapons. And that's kind of what I want to talk about for a little bit of time. I want to talk about I am the weapon. Look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, I am the weapon. People of God, I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt that there is nothing better than being used by God. As a matter of fact, some wise but unknown soul declared that the art of life is to live in the present moment and to make that moment as perfect as we can by the realization that we are the instruments and expression of God himself. I want you to know that though God has many uh, ways and many uh, people that he uses and he chooses as his instruments, it is not far-fetched to understand that we are the instruments of God. I want to impose on you. I want to impress upon you. I want to say it very clearly to you that you need to look in the mirror. You need to check yourself and say to yourself with regularity, I am an instrument of God. You are so much of an instrument, let me say to you, that anything in God's hands is powerful. 
As a matter of fact, you should pray this prayer, this well-known prayer, and I give it to you even now by some wise soul who said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is doubt, let me sow faith. Where there is despair, let me sow hope. Where there is darkness, let me sow light. And where there is sadness, let me sow joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as much as to console. That I may not seek to be understood as much as to understand. To not just to be loved as much as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I, I got to get out of here. I said I wasn't preaching hard, but I want you to know once again, people of God, that you are an instrument of God, and instruments of God are powerful. I got to get out of here. I said it and I'll say it again. You are instruments of God and instruments of God are powerful. As a matter of fact, we are God's gift to each other like a master composer. He brings all of the instruments together, each with a different tone, each playing a different part. But yet we are all his instruments. I said it and I'll say it again. You are the instruments of God and instruments of God are powerful. I want you to understand people of God that an instrument is a tool that is actively used to change something that that God has called all of his people to be instruments of change in his redemptive work and how he is doing things in this present time. I said you're an instrument of God. And instruments of God are powerful. Uh, don't ever think that you are more than, than, never believe that you are less than. Let God play beautiful melodies through you because you are an instrument of God. And instruments of God are powerful. I want you to understand, and I got to get out of here. I said I wasn't preaching hard, but it is clear to me that there, if there is something that the enemy does not want you to know, he does not want you to be clear on how powerful you are in God. As a matter of fact, he's doing everything he can to hide from you the trueness of your identity so that you will never realize the real relationship and connection between you and God, that you will never recognize the true redemptive work that took place when Christ died for us on the cross and reconciled us to God the Father which placed us in a position where we could be instruments of God. He never wants you to know the power that you have to heal, the power that you have to declare, the power that you ha have to be able to do as the word says even greater than the Lord Jesus Christ did while he was here on earth. Somebody ought to shout I'm an instrument of God. I got to get out of here, but I'll say it and I'll say it again, and that is that instruments of God are powerful. And I want to point something out to you, and I want to help you, and I want to encourage you. And as I do this, let me say, first of all, that it is a privilege, somebody ought to shout a privilege, it is a privilege to be used by God. I want to suggest to you in this time where everybody is focusing on themselves and focusing on what they're going to get out of the deal and focusing on what they can have, let me say to you, and I say it loud and clear, it is a privilege to serve and be used by God. I know it's not powerful. I know it's all about what you can have, but let me blow your mind by saying to you, I dare you to serve God, and I dare Dare you to experience the blessing of what it is to walk in the privilege of serving the great God that I serve. I got to get out of here. Somebody ought to shout it's a privilege. It's not a job. It's not a burden. It's not a hassle. It's not heavy. It is a privilege. I said it and I'll say it again. It's a privilege. 
It's not a job for me to come here and worship him. It's not a job for me to come here and preach for him. It's not a job for me to clap my hands and lift him up. It's not a job for me to shout hallelujah and thank you, God, because he's worthy. It's not a job to bless his people, to help his people, to encourage his people, to push his people. It's not a job. It is a privilege. I got to get out of here. I said I wasn't going to holler at y'all, but look at somebody and tell them it's a privilege. Yeah. And I know, I know in 20 and 22, everybody's trying to make everything that we do for God a job. But let me say to you that because he has been so good to me and because he has blessed me and because he's opened doors for me and because he died for me, it is a privilege to serve and be used by God. I got to get out of here. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. I counted a joy. He can wake me up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, tell me to go and bless somebody. It's a privilege. He can tell me to go and help somebody, to take what I have in my resource to bless somebody. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to counsel somebody, to encourage somebody, to help them through a problem, to help them over a mountain, to walk through them with a valley. I tell you, it is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. God didn't have to do it, but I'm so glad he did. And I know a whole lot of people that after the fact, they wish they had more time to serve them. They wish they had a greater opportunity to serve them. There are folks who are laying on their back in a bed that said, Lord, if you just give me one more chance, I'll serve you. If y'all don't remember the prayer of Hezekiah, Hezekiah said, God, if you give me more time, I can't worship you in the grave, but if you let me live, I'll praise you. I'll lift you up. I'll magnify you. Somebody ought to shout, it's a privilege instruments of God are powerful because they understand that it's a privilege to be used of God it's a privilege to serve God it's not just a burden it's not a heaviness it's a joy don't you let the devil fool you I still believe the word of God and the joy of the Lord is my strength when the things you do for God start becoming a burden, you start convincing yourself that you have a right to be uptight with God for what you do when serving God is a privilege. But not only that, not only that, can I, can I drop something else on you? I've also figured out that to be used by God is to be a part of God's plan. That out of all that God is doing, God has created you and set you in a place to be a part of his plan, which means if you are in God's plan, you are also in God's hand. That God has chosen to place you in his hand to carry out his plan, which means you are a powerful instrument of God. I, I got to get out of here. I'm sorry. Uh, can, I, can I drop something else on you? I, I, I'm going to move this train. Watch this. I, I figured out that, that you're powerful. You're powerful because you're an instrument of God. But to be used by God means that you were created with purpose. And the power of your purpose is that God has a plan for your life. God will use his plan and the purpose that he has tapped attached to you to prosper you. Instruments of God are powerful. Instruments of God are powerful. Instruments of God are powerful. And you are an instrument of God. <laughs> to be an instrument of God simply says that you in God's hand are an instrument or an agent of change. That every time God wants to change something, that every time God wants to affect something, that every time God wants to do something, you are a candidate to get it done because you are an instrument of God. That God is willing to use you to make a change. Watch this. That everything the devil tries to jack up, God is willing to use you to change jacked up stuff. 
Now watch the power of this, and I'm on my way out of here. Watch this. Uh, the, thing, the thing that I get excited about is because I asked God, I said, why don't you just get the devil out of the way? And God told me, he said, it's because I'm not afraid of the devil. You want to move the devil because you're afraid of the devil. I can let the devil do what he does, and watch this. And he can't stop me from doing what I do. Uh, Y'all don't believe me. Watch this. The devil can make you sick, but he can't stop God from healing you. The devil can bring you trouble, but he can't stop God from delivering you. The devil can shut doors in your face, but he can't stop God from opening doors that no man can shut. Now, the reason this ought to be powerful for you is that the devil hasn't recognized it yet, but for everything that he's trying to do to you, God can undo it, get glory out of it, and use you in the process, and the devil can't do nothing about it. I, I got to get out of here. I'm sorry. I apologize. You, you are an agent of change, but not only that, you are valuable for God's divine outcome. That before God actually does it, he says, I'm going to use you to do it because you are an instrument of God. So while you are uptight about the process that you go through, you must also celebrate that God has connected you to the process in order to get you to an outcome of which he is using you as an instrument which means you shouldn't be sad, you should be happy because the process is en route to the outcome. And you already know the outcome. You should be happy that you are being used in the process to get to what God wants to do. I got to get out of here. I'm sorry. I apologize. Can I drop something else on you? Uh, watch this. And while you are an instrument for others, others are an instrument for you which means that in the process of that, we are all instruments of God. That while God is using you, be very clear, he's also using somebody else. That while God is using them, he's also using you. Now, the power in that is this, because sometimes you get wiped out because you feel like you got too much going on with you. But be very clear that while God is using you for somebody else, God is going to use somebody else for you. And in the process of that, all of us can get in on the shout of being instruments of God because God is doing it all for us all. I got to get out of here. I'm sorry. I apologize. I said I wasn't preaching hard, but instruments of God are powerful. If we knew how powerful and how much of a blessing it was that was tied to those who are instruments of God, then we would stop running away from serving God. We would stop trying to control the opportunities that God gives us to be in place to be used by him. Y'all miss what I just said. We stop trying to find other things to fill up our schedules. And we would start creating opportunities of availability for God that whenever he put us in a position or a place to do something, we would say, Lord, here am I. I got to get out of here. We would have no problem if we understood. If we understood the real power in being an instrument of God. Never miss an opportunity. Never miss a chance where God can use you. And then in the process of that, guess what would happen? You would see purpose in everything. You would see purpose in everything that happens to you, everything that takes place in your life, knowing that all things are working together for your good, that God really does have a plan, and God really will prosper you, and God really will give you a great outcome and not fail you. I got to get out of here, that God really will prosper you. Look, I I'm saying all of this because it's in the text. Our text takes us to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the grandson of Edo, the priest, as noted by Ezra, the man of God. Zechariah prophesies to the people of God in Judah after they return from the 70 years in Babylonian captivity. 70 years they were in prison. 70 years they were locked down in slaves. 
70 years, they were in a place where they, were, they couldn't get out, couldn't get away, were subject and subjected. And y'all know how it was for them because when you read in the Word of God, this is what it says in Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat and we wept as we hung our harps on the willow trees and our captives required of us a song. And they said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But we said, how can we sing the Lord's song? Y'all remember? In a strange land. They talked about how awesome and how terrible it was to be in this captivity, to be in a place where they were headed by a fella by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all remember captivity in Babylon? You remember names like Daniel and Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego where they took all the young people and they tried to sub subjugate them and they tried to use all of their gifts and turn it towards the enemy. Y'all miss what I said. Y'all remember Babylonian captivity? It came in three efforts. They they took three different times to bring all the people of God to one place where they could be in bondage. They even gouged out the eyes of one of their kings and made him walk blind and bald and chained to lead his people into the Y'all remember? And they were in this for 70 years. 70 years they were in captivity, 70 years. And God sends a prophet by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah, whose name in and of itself speaks to what God is going to do for them. Zechariah, which means Yahweh remembers that God has not forgotten them after 70 years. 70 years they've been locked up and God has not forgotten them. Even after Babylon, God has not forgotten. Can I drop something on you? I don't want to bother you too bad, but I do want to help you to understand that no matter what you've gone through, Good, bad, or indifferent, let me put Zachariah's name and ministry in front of you. God still remembers you. I know, I know you dropped the ball, you made some bad choices, you made some bad decisions, you weren't always on track, you weren't always in the place you should have been in. I got good news for you. God has sent the man of God here to put a Zachariah anointing on you and remind you that God remembers you. Yeah, he remembers you. He remembers you even though you weren't thinking about him at that point, even though he wasn't at the top of your list, wasn't at the forefront of your mind. God says, tell them, and God remembers them. Uh, the power of God remembering you is this, that if God remembers you, what he's also saying is, my promises are still good for you. Okay, y'all don't know when to holler. Uh, notice the power of this. You jacked up and you weren't on track, but God says, I still remember you, and I still remember what I told you, and I still remember what was prophesied to you, and I still remember what I promised you, and I still remember what I said I was going to do with you, and I still remember I got a future for you. I got to get out of here. Somebody ought to shout, he remembers me. Uh, the power of this is that Zechariah's job was to encourage his people and to help them to understand that God had remembered them. He had not forgotten all of the things that he had told them. As a matter of fact, Zechariah was a contemporary of Haggai, and that means they were preaching at the same time to the same people. And notice they had two very different messages. For when Zechariah preached, he preached a message of encouragement. But when Haggai preached, he preached a message of saying, consider your ways. He was hard on them. He preached hard. And watch this, and God taught me something, and I hope you get it. The power of this is both of them were called by God. Both of them were anointed by God. Both of them preached to the same people, but both of them came from two different directions. One preached a harsh message. One of them preached an encouraging message. And both of them were called of God. Y'all miss what I just said. What that teaches me is that God calls us to a place of balance, which means that we got to stop choosing stuff just because it's comfortable for us. There's some stuff that God is going to give you that's going to be hard for you. And then there's other stuff that God is going to give you that's going to be encouraging for you. And God is going to balance it out because sometimes you need something hard and sometimes you need something encouraging. 
But stop discounting the differences of gifts in the body of Christ because you don't like something at one minute when in fact what you need is balance. You need somebody to hug you up, but hugging ain't all you need. Sometimes you need somebody to push you along. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Anybody who got children in here, you understand that sometimes you got to speak hard to them and sometimes you got to hug them and love them up and you got to give them the balance so that you give them not too much of either but enough of both so that they can be good and balanced and on track. Somebody ought to shout, yes, Lord. The power of this is that Haggai and Zechariah preach at the same time. Both of them are preaching to the same people. Both of them are called of God and ultimately both of them are necessary. They create balance for the kingdom and we got to understand that even in all of these churches that we have, there are going to be different ministries, different leaders, different pastors are going to have different callings and responsibilities and that doesn't make one better or less than the other. What it means is that God has given the body of Christ a balance because there's some people that need this and some people that need that and ultimately we are all called by God to ultimately give God glory because watch this we are instruments of God got to get out of here it is in our text that God gives Zechariah prophetic insight into the future of the people of God that after they have had a hard time in bondage that though they have struggled, that though they have had their, though their burdens in the heat of the day, that though they are in a place where ultimately it has been challenging for them, the future still look bright. I, I want to say this to you. I'm on my way out of here. I'm not preaching long. Watch this. Uh, the power of what God says to us is we have been through COVID. We going through monkeypox. We dealing with inflation. We're dealing with every crisis on every hand, a mental breakdown of an entire culture and generation. Y'all miss what I just said. And in this, God says, I want you to hear me clearly. I still have a bright future for you. Okay, y'all missed it. I hope you get it. I'm going to say it again. Somebody needs to get it in your head. Uh, ultimately, God has a bright future for you. In spite of everything that has happened and all the challenges that have taken place, and watch this, and some of the things we are dealing with ain't just the enemy. Some of the stuff we're dealing with is our own fault from our own decisions. Y'all ain't going to talk back to me, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And in the process of that, hear the power of what God is saying. I know you've been jacked up. I know you have not been on track. I know you have made poor decisions. I know that the enemy took advantage of your self-centeredness and you being consumed with yourself. But in the midst of all of that, he says, I still have a future for you. Your future, watch this, still looks bright. I know you don't have all the answers. Y'all gonna make me holler. I'm trying not to do it. I know that you haven't on, not on target about everything, but watch this. I still have got a future for you. Uh, I want you to understand, people of God, and I'm on my way out of here, but watch this. I, I want you to understand that there are two observ observations that are extremely important. And one of them is this, that the people of God suffered in Babylonian captivity not because they were righteous. They suffered because they were wrong. Y'all missed what I said. Now, I figured I wouldn't get a whole lot of hollering on that. Because we don't like to admit when we're wrong. And we'd rather be the victim than to be responsible. But God is pushing us to a place to be accountable, watch this, for where we are. A lot of places of where we are is we got us there. Y'all ain't liking me. And some of us would rather keep going in that direction rather than admitting that that's the wrong direction to go in. We are self-consumed. We are a selfie generation. We are overwhelmed with selfishness. We don't know how to absence ourselves from our own self. Our own feelings are making us a sick culture so that we can't even balance our emotions because we so stuck on us. And the Bible says, and in the last days, that men and women will be lovers of themselves and we haven't figured out yet that God told us to love him first 
And he said, and after you love me first, these are the two great commandments with which you can hang all the rest. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your body, everything that is within you. Love God with it. And the second is like an unto the first and love your neighbor. Y'all miss what I just said. As yourself. Which means it's not either or, it's both and. And simultaneously, when you recognize the love that you have for yourself, you should be expending and extending that love to everybody you come in contact with. Y'all miss what I just said. It's not you spend all of your time trying to figure you out. As you step along and understand how you love, you love other folks just like that. Y'all miss what I just said. I got to get out of here. Somebody ought to shout, help us, Lord. So some of the stuff we dealing with, we in it because of us. They were in captivity because of them. They weren't there because they were righteous and wonderful. They were there because they were self-centered. They were unfocused. They were not committed to God. They put everything in front of God. They were there because they started worshiping other gods and setting other priorities. And God said, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do for you. I ain't going to put you in bondage. I'm just going to remove my hand from you. Can I drop something on you? God ain't got to hurt you. All God got to do is to honor your request and leave you alone. There's stuff that's been looking for you for a long time that God has kept from you. Old folks, you put it this way. He kept me from dangers seen and unseen. And the only thing that has protected you is his hand. God says, okay, I'm going I'm to honor your request. If you don't want me to be your priority, I'm going to get out of your way. And all I'm going to do is remove my hedge that has been around you. How many people know I need the hedge of God? Because I need God to be the buffer, the protector. Y'all got, got, got to help me preach this of everything that's trying. Because I know the devil has put a target on my back. And I declare like the songwriter, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be. I got to get out of here. Somebody ought to shout, yes, Lord. So they were, they were in bondage. They were in bondage because of themselves. And God still gave them a future. And those who God allowed to make them suffer. One of the powers of this text is this. He is also sending notice out to them. That for the suffering that you infused on my people, even though I used it to help them to recognize how bad they needed me, I still have to deal with you for making my people suffer. Y'all miss what I just said. Now, I learned from this, you got to be careful how you treat people and write folks off because you have put them in an enemy category because God is too righteous to simply side with you. God is righteous enough that he going to bring about righteousness in every situation. So that means even though you wrong with how you dealing with people that wronged you, he still got to deal with your wrong. I got to get out of here. Y'all ain't liking me. I'm sorry. I'm making y'all mad. I apologize. I'm getting ready to close it. But I got to understand, people of God, that this teaches me, be careful how you treat people, even when you've concluded where you think they are. God is not only righteous for the wronged, he is also righteous for the wrong when they are wronged. And after a hard time, in the hands of the Babylonians, God sends the people of God back home. And it's in verse 9 that they are given a messianic prophecy, which alludes to that which calls us even yet to Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Now, we know we preach this when it comes to Palm Sunday because later on we'll see that it speaks to Jesus riding in on a donkey. It's a messianic prophetic word. But the power of this for this moment that I give to you is that the text says to us, your king is coming to you. Here comes the shout. The shout is in the fact that God knows we can't meet him where he is sometime. And because of that, he loves us enough that he'll come to us. You don't know when to holler, okay. The power of this is sometimes I just ain't got God on my mind to get where he is. Sometimes I just don't have the ability or the capability or the focus or the mindset. But I thank God that my testimony is when I couldn't come get him, he came and got me. 
I, I wish somebody would just shout, he came and got me. I, I wish somebody would say it like you meant it. He came and got me. That when I was hard-headed and hard-hearted, when I was unfocused and not on track, when I wasn't doing the right thing, he still called my name. He still came and got me. He still pulled me in. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I must be talking to the wrong crowd. I wish somebody would shout, he came and got me. Lord, I'm trying my best not to raise my voice. The power of the text is he says your king is coming. I got to get out of here. Watch this. Verse 11 encourages us even further and speaks in the midst of a challenging dilemma. And notice that ultimately the people of God went back home to a tore up place with no money and only a third of the people. They went back to nothing. They went back to zero. That when they got set free from the Babylonians and God tells them go home. There was nothing there. It was 70 years later. The temple was tore down. All their houses were gone. Everything was rock and dirt. There was nothing there. And when they went back, they didn't get a reprieve. They didn't get no money. They didn't get nothing to say you've been in bondage for 70 years. They didn't get a set of clothes. They didn't get a check. They didn't get nothing. All they got was y'all can go on back home. And when they went back home, they went back home to nothing. I got to get out of here. But notice what God says, and I'm on my way out of here. Watch this. He says in the text that I read to you, because of the blood of your covenant. I got to get out of here. He says, he says, because we got a covenant uh, and it's been cut with blood because there's something between you and I. Now notice this comes out of the fact that the prophet Zechariah's job is to preach to them and God remembers. By the time we get to verse 11, we see the power of this remembrance. God said, because we got a covenant, because me and you got something going on, you may have forgotten it, but I didn't forget it. You may not have operated in it, but I'm still operating. You may have gotten off track with it, but I'm still on track with it. I, I got to get out of here, but can I tell y'all something? One of the things that the word teaches me is this, that God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. And the power of who God is, is that God does not deal with us according to how we deal with him. God deals with us according to himself, which means that even when he spoke, speaks to Hosea, he says to Hosea, y'all been jacked up and I got a right to wipe all of y'all out. And then he says, but I am God and I'm not man. I can't do like y'all do. I can't operate like y'all operate. Because the thing that's holding me to where I am is not y'all, but it's my own word. And when I gave y'all my word, it meant something. I got to get out of here. I wish I had time to preach. I almost feel like hollering, but I dare you turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, his word still means something. <laughs> that everything he said, that everything he declared, his word still means something. That every promise he made and everything he put out there, his word still means something. That everything he put out there for your future, your life, everything he declared for you, even though you jacked up some stuff along the way, it still means something. And his word shall not return void unto him, but it shall accomplish the very purpose for which it has been sent. I wish somebody would throw your head back and put your hands up and declare, and his word still means something. Uh, okay, I got to get out of here. I said I wasn't preaching hard, but the power of it is, he says, because we have a blood covenant. Uh, watch this. Even though you've forgotten that I haven't, even though you stopped coming to church, I didn't stop blessing you. Even though you stopped serving, I didn't stop doing for you. Even though you stopped being serious about me, I never stopped being serious about you. Even though you stopped loving me, I never stopped loving you. Even though you stopped being good to me, I never stopped being good to you. And even though you wouldn't lift up your hands for me, I'm going to lift up my hand. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to favor you. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to look out for you. I dare somebody throw your head back and tell God thank you. The power of this is he says we have a covenant and watch what he says and I'm on my way out of here. He says because we have a covenant I'm going to set 
all of your prisoners free from the very thing that has held them captive. Okay, I said I wasn't preaching hard, but I almost feel it and I feel my voice change and I apologize. But look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, everything that's kept you in bondage, God says, I've got the power to set you free from it. Everything that has inhibited your deliverance, God says, I got good news for you. I'm going to deliver the very things that have kept you captive. Okay, you ain't happy yet. Throw your head back and tell God, God, however you want to deliver me, however you want to set me free, however you want to make it better for me, Lord, do what only you can do. I got to get out of here, but notice what God says because we got a covenant. You forgot it and I didn't. I'm going to set all of my prisoners free. I'm going to put deliverance in you in such a way that the very thing that has held you captive, I'm going to make sure you get set free. I dare somebody declare rescued because that's what deliverance means it means anything that is trying to hold on to you that God is trying to get you to be free in God is going to come and rescue you I wish somebody would say like they used to sing rescue me the whole power of this is that God now says and when I rescue you then I want you to return to the stronghold well what was the stronghold the stronghold was the place that as they used to sing take me back to the place where I first received you in other words I want you to go on back home and on your way home I want you to stop by the church house now when you get there it ain't gonna be no building so you're gonna have to learn how to bless me and praise me in the middle of the rocks and the dirt you ain't gonna have no instruments all you gonna have is foot tapping and hand clapping you ain't gonna have a whole lot of bells and whistles uh, but I put a whole lot of stuff in you uh, that I'm going to use you as an instrument uh, that when you get back home to where I brought you from uh, I'm going to show you what I can do uh, I got to get out of here somebody ought to shout yes Lord uh, notice the power of God he says return to the stronghold uh, go back home even though it looks like nothing is there uh, I got to move this train but look at your neighbor tell them neighbor it may not look look like much but little is much when God is in it and isn't that the power of how God really works he'll send you to something that don't look like nothing so that he can work through you and make it something see some of y'all you don't know how to be a pioneer you only know how to be a settler settlers just go into stuff that's ready made but I thank God for a pioneer spirit the kind of spirit where it don't look like nothing but you can still walk in and have a vision. You can still see what it can be. You can still declare what's going to happen. You can still say, my future is bright. I got to get out of here. It's getting late. I dare somebody give the air a high five and declare it may not look like nothing now, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Can I get a witness in the house? I'm on my way out of here. I said I wasn't preaching hard. But God says, go back to what looks like nothing. And when you go back, you're asking the question, how are you going to do it? I'll tell you how. Because though it looks like nothing, you're going back with everything. Uh, well, Bishop, how am I going back with everything? You just said, I got nothing. But God made you a promise. And the promise was he was going to work it out. Y'all miss what I just said. The value is in the promise. Uh, that if God promises you anything, uh, God cannot lie. Uh, God says when you go back to what looks like nothing, uh, you start putting stuff in your hand because you got a promise. Uh, you start seeing stuff that ain't there because you got a promise. Uh, you start acting like you already got it because you got a promise. Uh, you start walking and would look like it ain't there because you got a promise. Uh, I wish somebody would throw your head back, uh, put your hands up, uh, and declare, I got a promise. Uh, and because God made me a promise, I believe that God will bring it all to pass. Somebody on the shout, hallelujah. I'm sorry, y'all. I said I wasn't preaching hard, but I feel like preaching now. I dare you throw your head back. Put your hands up and 
and declare God's going to do it because I got a promise and if God said it I believe that God can and God will won't he do it in he able shout yes somebody well now I'm on my way out of here but notice what God says I'm going to do it I'm going to fix it for you I'm going to turn it around for you I'm going to make it happen for you and watch this he then says to them I declare that I will restore unto you everything that you lost and I will give you double for your trouble can I get a witness I got to get out of here but that is the promise I know you lost some stuff I know it's been hard for you I know it's been a challenge I know it's been a struggle I know you've been through it but I got good news for you and that is you got double coming I dare somebody throw your head back put your hands up and declare I got double and watch what God says I'm going to show you now what the plan is the plan is that when I do it I'm going to put you in my hand and I'm going to turn you into an instrument I'm going to use you to do what I'm getting ready to do and by the time I get finished I want you to understand I know what your worry is that somebody's going to come along and attack you and mess with you and try to take from you because you're vulnerable you're in a place where it looks like the enemy can come and sweep you out but watch what I'm going to do I'm going to turn you from an instrument to a weapon and I'm going to let you be my weapon well now I'm on my way out of this place I'm going to leave you all alone but can I tell you I'm not only an instrument but I am a weapon and the power of being a weapon is that what it means is this next battle is not my battle but a weapon is in the hands of a fighter this battle belongs to the Lord look at your neighbor Tell them, Nabum, I am a weapon. And God is the battle axe. He is the fighter. He is the captain of the battlefield. He's never lost a battle. God is my fighter. And I am his weapon. And he said he's going to use me to take care of business. I dare somebody throw your head back. Put your hands up and declare right now, use me to take care of your business. Use me to take care of your enemies. Use me to take care of your situation. In the able, won't he do it? In the able, shout yeah. I got to get out of here. Woo. I said I wasn't, I got to get out of here, y'all. I said I wasn't preaching hard. I dare somebody shout, I'm a weapon, I'm a weapon, I'm a weapon! Woo! I get out of here, I'm sorry. I, apolo Woo, I apologize. I almost lost myself, I apologize. I'm a weapon. God says, you ain't got to worry, you got my promise. And I know you're vulnerable, because you're going back to nothing. But this fight ain't yours. All you are is the weapon. I'm the fighter. You the weapon. And every fight that I fought, I've won. I've never lost a battle. All you got to be is the weapon. That every time I swing, you just swing. That every time I push, you just be pushed. That every time I lift you, just be lifted. That every time I impose on you, just be imposed. Because you are the weapon, but I am the fighter. I'm done, y'all. I'm finished. I got to get out of here. Y'all know, like I know, that any fighter who uses a weapon 
take special care of a weapon that they use. If you're going to use a gun, you're going to keep it clean. If you're going to use a knife, you're going to keep it sharp. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. If you're going to use a club, a bat, you're going to keep it smooth. You want whatever you're going to use to be usable. And so in the midst of that, that means that God is going to take extra good care of you because you are the weapon. All right, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm going back to my seat. I've completed my assignment. Can I tell you one more thing? And that is this. If you are the weapon and God is the fighter and God has never lost a battle, which means every time God fights, he's going to win. If you are in God's hand, watch this. Every time he wins, you win. Every time he gets a victory, you get a victory. Every time he beats up on the devil, you beat up on the devil. Look, I want to encourage you. You are a weapon, an instrument of God to be forged against whatever is coming at you and you are a winner. I'm done. I'm finished. I said I, I, said I wasn't hollering. Y'all made me holler a little bit. I apologize. I said I wasn't going to raise my voice. I raised it just a little bit. I apologize again. But the truth is you, you're an instrument. You're a weapon. You've been worried about too much stuff. You've been uptight about too much. The things you should be focused on, you're not. And that's part of what the devil does to distract you so that you won't focus on what's important. You're caught up in stuff you don't even have power control over. You're trying to be the fighter when you're supposed to be the weapon. Y'all miss what I just said. You should count it a privilege just that God would take you into battle. That God would take you into the conflict and God says, and I'm going to use you to get this next victory. Hello, did somebody catch what I just said? God said, I'm going to use you to get this next victory. Hello, somebody missed it. I heard God say, I'm going to use you to get this next victory. Stop whining because you in the fight. God is going to use, he told you, I'm going to use you to get the victory. But the fight ain't yours. Fight is mine. All you are is the weapon. Today, I pray you go back home and you think differently about your circumstance. To all the stuff that you said look like nothing, instead of worrying about it, remember all you are is a weapon. God's promise and his job is to take care of all of that. Your job is to be in God's hands so that he can use you to make a change, to make a difference, to turn it around. You are in the service of God. That's why I tell people, stop running from serving him. Don't you understand that what God is served by, God must protect? That every time you deny your anointing, you deny your protection. Y'all miss what I just said. The reason that I'm still protected, I've been preaching now for almost 40 years, next year, 40 years. That's a long time, ain't it? The power of that is this. I haven't always made the best decisions. I haven't always been right. I haven't always been on target. I know everybody thinks I'm just a smart guy. Smart guys don't mean you don't make, this, you don't make bad choices sometimes. Amen, somebody. You can be young and smart, but you make sometimes young, dumb mistakes. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I'm going to tell you a secret. In everything that I've been through, God has kept me and protected me. And it's not because I'm so wonderful, but it is because he has purpose on my life. And I decided a long time ago that come hell or whatever, I'm going to serve him. And I promised him that I would serve him until I die. Hello, somebody. I'm telling you, an instrument in the hand of God is powerful. You don't know what you are selling short. There's a lot of stuff you've been trying to get out of by yourself. You ain't got to get out of it if you were a vessel, if you were an instrument, if you were a weapon in his hand. He's in charge of it. And the more you understand who you are, the better decisions you make. I once was young. I'm now I'm old. I make better choices now. Ain't nobody saying nothing. I don't make perfect choices, but God knows I make better choices. Some of that just comes with time and wisdom. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And in the process of that, in the process, God has used me as an instrument. I'm not the only instrument. Guess what? Y'all are instruments too. 
You're just fighting against what God wants to do in you. You are in opposition to what God is trying to free you in to be free with. God says, I want to use you and you won't let me. I want to bless you and you're blocking it. I want to put you in my service, but you're trying to do everything but serve me. Y'all miss what I just said. And then you want to run to God and say, God, give me power and get a quick power surge and then run away and be without God. It's all about relationship. See, one of the things that God loved about David is this. David, if you follow his life, was not perfect by far. But he was a man after God's own heart. And can I tell you a secret about David? Whether he was right or whether he was wrong, he was always with God. Y'all miss what I just said. See, some of y'all want to be wrong and act like God ain't there. And then when you get in trouble, you want to go get God. No, 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 no. See, you got to love God enough that whether you're right or wrong, it's like parenting. I don't want my children to just come to me when they right. I'm their father whether they right or wrong. Amen, somebody. And because I love them, I'm going to do everything I can to help them and to get them in a better position, even if they made a mistake. What I don't want them to do is to deny that I'm their father because they're scared to come talk to me. He just wants you to be with him. The thing that Jesus died for is this, your relationship with him. That's what he died for. Your relationship, not your perfection. He took care of that. He said, when the father sees you, he's going to see me. He's going to see my blood that is shed for you. You're going to be made righteous in the sight of my father. So it ain't good that God is looking for from you. If that was the case, Jesus would have never come. Amen, somebody. He's looking at you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he wants from you most is relationship. Why are you trying not to hang with him in good, bad, or indifferent? Why don't you want to be tight with him? You know, I look at where the church is evolved. I'm on my way to my seat. My time is up. But the power of the, of the church is this. You know, folks say, well, we don't want to be in church long. We don't want to do this. Watch this. Y'all say y'all want to go to heaven. What do you think is going to be the agenda in heaven? You say you want to be with the Father forever. You want to be in heaven. You, I want to walk around heaven all day. And you mean to tell me you only want to come to church for one hour a week? Y'all confused. You done let the devil tangle up your mind. You want to be with God forever? Ain't no going to the mall in heaven. Ain't no we going to stop by the movies in heaven. Ain't no I'm going to watch, I'm going to binge watch my show on TV up in glory. You saying you want to be with him because you want to be in his presence. You want to ex experience the power of his glory. And then you want to come to church for an hour and get out so you can do what you want to do. And you'd be afraid, you'd be shamed if God said, well, if you don't want to hang with me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to honor your request. You don't have to be with me. Then you go on and you go on, but you only got two choices, either to be with me or to be away from me. If you with me, you with me. If you away from me, I didn't send you away. I honored your request. You didn't want to hang with me. You didn't like my agenda. Even though, watch this, I made you for me. Some of y'all are funny. So you tell your kids, I brought you in this world. I take you out and make another one look just like you. All right? So you tell your kids because you expect them to do what you lead, guide, and direct them to do. When they get older, you want them to spend time with you, you know. I remember I used to take my, take my kids to school. You know, they want to hug me. want to hug me. Then they got older, they ain't want to hug no more. Oh, dad, just drop me off. Drop you off. Then when they get older, I just had, I just had another grandchild uh, this week, this week, a couple days ago. And, uh, and in the midst of when they get older, they want to hug you all the time. Because then they're thinking, you know, time is limited. They don't know how long I'm going to be around. I hope I hang around a long time. Don't get, I, this is not a prophetic word. I'm getting ready to leave y'all. But as you get older, you have more appreciation. I thank God I still got my parents. I want to hug up on them all the time. I want to talk to them. I want to see how they're doing. I want to see how they're feeling. You all right. You need anything. My prayer every day is, Lord, use me to bless my parents. Y'all miss what I said. I pray for my parents every day that God would keep no good thing from them. Give them the desires of their heart. And if you got to use me to do it, God, here am I. Am I making sense to anybody? 
God just wants relationship with you. He wants you to want to hang with him. He wants you to want to be around him. He wants you to be able to come to him no matter what. He wants you to want to be in his space and all the things that he likes to do and wants you to do and that he made you for. And you're doing everything to get away from that. That's what Jesus died for. And you said you on your way to heaven, but all you got for him is an hour or two a week. Y'all would quit somebody if they was your boyfriend or your girlfriend and all they gave you was an hour or two a week. You go to divorce court if the person you said you loved but didn't want to spend no time. Y'all ain't talking back to me. And yet God remembers his promises with you. He remembers what he declared for you. He still wants you. I'm out of here. I say to somebody who may not be saved, who may not have a relationship with the Lord, God loves you so very much. God cares for you. He went through all of that trouble so that you could have a real relationship, not so that you could be this perfect person. He wants to enjoy the journey of your development. Even preachers who preach, we ain't perfect. Stop trying to make us something that we not. We, we doing a job that we got called to do. This wasn't at the top of my list. I was on my way to law school. I was going to be the best lawyer in life, and I was happy with that. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. God had another plan. God has a plan for your life. That plan is to prosper you and not fail you. Stop finding every excuse to be out of relationship with him. The people in church, he's not asking you to get connected because of the people in church. He's asking you to get connected because he loved you. God bankrupted himself for you. The Bible says, and God gave his only begotten son. If he gave what he only had one of, God bankrupted himself in that area so that you could have a right to the tree of life. If that's you, I invite you. You under the sound of my voice. Get out of your seat. Make your way down this aisle. God loves you. God cares for you. We invite you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're with us virtually, somebody who may not have a personal relationship with God, I declare that today is your day. Give your life to him because he loves you. He cares for you. I'm about to pray this prayer in just a moment, but we say to you, there's no better time than the present. Everybody wants to be with God in the end. God says, I want you to be with me in the process. Jesus said, if you own me now, I'll own you later. You remember me now, I'll remember you later. If that's you, you know you need a relationship with God. Get out of your seat. Make your way down this aisle. If it's you and you're with us virtually, I'm about to pray this prayer and I want you to pray it with me. Every head is bowed in this place. God, we thank you for who you are. You are our Father. You are our God. We love you. We thank you for loving us so much that you gave us the best you had. Now, God, there's somebody who may want to give their lives to you and they're praying this prayer with me even now. Father, I am a sinner. I need you in my life. I know you love me because you gave the best for me. I want to be in relationship with you. Now come into my heart. Come into my life and save me because I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. Now empower me to live the life that I cannot live on my own. In Jesus' name, amen. As you prayed that prayer, virtually I say to you, no better time than now to recognize how saved and how blessed you are. You are a son, a daughter of God. You're in the family of faith. If you're under the sound of my voice and you prayed that prayer and now you want to hook up and connect to this place called Temple, we say to you, you can do it. You can either do that online if you're with us virtually, or of course you can do that right now in the presence uh, our physical presence if you are here in this sanctuary. If that be you, won't you come? Won't you come? If that's you online, I believe that there are means with which uh, they can contact you and let you know what has just transpired and happened in your life. If you know you're saved and you're glad you're saved, come on, clap, clap, clap your hands. Thank God for how awesome he is. Somebody ought to shout, yes, Lord. Oh, come on and clap like you mean it. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together and give the Lord praise for he is worthy. Do me a favor. Lean over to somebody and tell them, be careful how you handle me. Because I'm a weapon. Tell somebody on the other side, be careful how you deal with me. Because I am a weapon of God. Were we not blessed by the word of the Lord?
Come on, let's stretch our hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the deliverer of the word. We pray that you restore strength, power, and virtue to him now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We are getting ready to be dismissed, but I want to take this last opportunity before we leave. If there is anyone here who did not have an opportunity to sow and tithe an offering to be able to do so, last week and this week, like that, we have asked all of those who have the ability to, to share with us in a 130 dollars seed we don't beg we ask and we're asking because we want you to do it we need you to do it we request your help to be able to get things done and accomplished here that we can push ministry forward the ushers have envelopes we have a basket here if you are giving electronically you can do so at the cash app at dollar sign church favor you can go straight to the website at tci-charlotte.com you can text to give is 336-891 something other something other something other I know when I'm looking at it but I don't know it without it 4023 I should know that number by heart by now 336-891-4023 you can text to give you can follow the prompts there your tithe your offering we are most certainly still given to our building fund as well as our first fruit that we use to bless and be a benefit to our man of God I want you to do that you cannot beat beat God's given no matter how hard you try he is consistently blessing us over and over and over again whether you heard it or not but Elder Greer gave a testimony that he gave out of his need he made a sacrifice last week and before the week was over the Lord sent him more than what he had given and he's going to do the same for you you and you so if you're given I want you to come on and do that you can come right here and bring it to the basket here give it to the usher wave your hand or your phone if you're given electronically so that we'll know that we have some participation God bless you thank you so much Thank you so much. I see people writing checks online if you're given. The options should be on the screen there that you can give electronically. We want to invite you to come to church with us. we got a few seats left. Uh, we are still shy in number of a lot of people that are in on vacation this week, but they will be back, and we're going to have church. Y'all coming back next week? We're going to be here at 9 o'clock again to have church. We have Bible study on Tuesday and prayer every morning at 6 a.m. Some of us have prayer every morning at 6 a.m., most of the time, I don't. But I was there today. Amen. The Lord is working. Praise God. Elder Kobe said you have no other choice but to be on prayer call this morning. Stand to your feet. Let's be dismissed. God wants a yes. Yes. Yes to his will. Yes to his way. When the cares of life weigh you down. Just know that he's making you, he's molding you, come, come what may, it's still yes, yes. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this moment, for this time that we have to share. Thank you for the word that was released, for the prophetic utterance that we received. We thank you for every gift, for every giver, for every seed sower, for every seed sown. We pray that as we leave this place, but never from your presence, you would go with us and you would be with us. That you would provide for us the miracles and the blessings and the favor that you have in your hand. You said that whatever we ask in Jesus' name, that you would give it to us. You said whatever we needed from you, you would supply. So we come in peace and we go in peace and we receive what it is you have for us in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, in this day and forevermore, we pray that you would continue to rebuke the devourer for our sake. We are praying for the healing and the deliverance of Mother Iris Greer. We're praying for every person that is sick or dealing with issues and death and all kinds of circumstances that are surrounding us. You, God, be a protection for us. Be our shield. Be our guide. Be our leader. One more time. And when you bless us this time, when you open up that window and pour out blessings that we won't have room to receive, when you open that door that no man can shut, when you give us the house, when you give us the job, when you increase the credit score, when you bless us the way we are expecting you to bless us this time, we'll tell everybody you did it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's give the Lord praise. You are dismissed and we'll see you tomorrow.